Okay, folks, we are back. It is 2 o'clock Central Time, top of the hour. We are into, uh, we have three left to go, so we're more than halfway through today. Uh, next up, we have Karen Lemke and Elizabeth von Trafikirken. I think I said that right. Please correct me if I'm wrong. From the Pine River <laughs> Library in Colorado. I probably butchered that, and I apologize. <laughs> Uh, but I butchered it humorously for the sounds of it. Um, they're going to be talking about circulating electronics, the good, the bad, and the ugly, sort of like my pronunciation. So uh, go ahead and take it away. All right. Thank you so much. I am Karen Lemke, and this is Elizabeth von Tofkirchen. <laughs> and we are here to present about circulating electronics, and we're really excited to do this um, and be part of this um, Today it's it's been really enjoyable and entertaining and and uh, and it's it's really been a pleasure to be part of this. So before we we get started, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about our library. We are based out of um, beautiful Southwest Colorado in Bayfield, Colorado, and it's a wonderful little town. The town itself has a population of about 2,300. However, we have a lot of residents in the surrounding area that do call Bayfield home. Uh, the 2010 census data indicates that we have about 8,200 people in our zip code. And our little library um, actually just got a little bit bigger. Uh, we just finished a 4,000 square foot expansion, and that uh, was to accommodate for the growth that we had in the last decade or so. Um, we originally had about 8,000 square feet, and we were able to add 4,000 square feet. So now we have a 12,000 square foot building. Um, the project really literally just finished. We opened five days ago, so we're a little frazzled. Um, but it's been really, really exciting to have this um, great new space for our community. So as librarians, especially in small libraries, we do find ourselves being very inventive much like Jacob von Hogflume, the inventor of time travel. Um, maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you will in the future. Uh, much like Jacob, we staffers of small libraries really have to find some new and inventive ways to be a part of our local community. And our presentation that we have today will be focusing on one of the, the programs that we have. And it's broken down into three parts, the good, the bad, and the ugly of circulating electronics. By our title, you may think that we have this negative um, tendency that we're leaning towards the negative, but we really feel that the good does outweigh the positive. And we're hoping that if you've thought about having a tech lending um, program at your own library, um, but you've been afraid, then maybe this presentation will encourage you to go forward and to move on with your own tech lending program. So we um, started our program by giving our patrons really um, some different devices to choose from. Um, at first, when we started the program, it was um, pretty limited, but we do like this idea and we've really adopted this philosophy that patrons should be able to try out different devices, especially patrons that are living in rural areas that might not have access to them. And so back in 2008, when we were thinking about um, circulating electronics, we, um, we didn't really have many patrons that had e-readers, and so we just started out with laptops. Um, I remember back at the circulation desk when I first started in 2007 and in 2008, uh, we had patrons that would come to our desk and they would say, oh, I have this great device, it's a Kindle, and you know, they'd pull out this huge device that reminds you of one of those old cell phones. Um, and they were so excited about it. And, and those were the conversations that we were having back in 2007 and 2008. Um, but quickly that really, really changed. Um, so we started out with these laptops. And um, around the end of 2008, we were able to receive some Sony um, e-readers. We first started out with one for our staff for us to try out. And then soon after that, we became part of the Sony library program. We received three e-readers from them. And we also had some marketing materials and some on-site training. By late 2010, our library joined the Across Colorado Digital Consortium, or ACDC, to provide digital titles to our patrons. And we are um, one of over 25 libraries in this consortium. And we have access to over 8,000 e-reader audio and video titles. But as the years progressed and as we you know, were more exposed to this digital content, we quickly realized that we needed more than just these laptops and a, a few e-readers. So 
we decided to go ahead and add some more devices. And this is a partial list. We're actually still adding devices in a few, probably in a month or so, we'll be adding a whole um, array of um, tablets to this list. But right now we have um, some early edition nooks. Um, we have you know, some, some of the basic black and white nooks, color nooks, uh, Kindle, Kindle Fires. Um, we have six Sony e-readers. Three of those were from the original program. Uh, we have 13 different MP3 players, and we have various brands that we circulate because, again, we want to give our patrons the opportunity to compare a, um, a Sony Walkman to a Zen Creative. So we have different types that patrons can check out. We also have a TomTom -Tom and a Garmin for checkout. Again, the laptops that we have and a flip camera and a projector that uh, we've been able to um, check out for patrons. In all, we have 43 devices at our last um, official count. Again, we're going to be adding some soon. Uh, to give you an idea of what that means, our library has roughly 8,000 patrons. Our annual circulations are um, roughly 95,000 items. Um, but those total devices that we had, um, those 43 devices that we've had since 2008, they have checked out a total of 940 times. And this actually, this data is a little stale. We need to update this. Again, um, we need to go back through and, and add those. It's actually more than 940 by now. Um, but that even breaks down to an average of 22 checkouts per item. So when you're comparing that to books that are in the collection, um, videos that are in the collection, you know, we, we, get, a good, um, we get good circulation stats on these, on these items. And we've, we've figured out some ways to help make this um, program good. And um, we really do have a lot of devices that we're checking out. And so we, we've come up with some ways to make it easier for our patrons and a better experience for our patrons. And the first thing we do is we offer a variety of handouts. I and mean, we have handouts for everything, at least we try to. Um, we have handouts for people that are using iPads. We don't even circulate those yet. We will soon. Um, but we uh, try and make it as easy as possible for all of our patrons to, um, to be able to access the content that we have and to be able to use the devices, whether they are their own devices or they're the library's devices. We also have handouts just describing the gadgets that we have at the library so that we can promote those easily and that staff can promote those easily. Um, and then again, we try and gear each of these handouts to the specific devices as much as we can. Um, we, again, just want to make it so simple and so easy for patrons. Some of them that may be really afraid of using technology, if they have these, these handouts, then they're really um, just more equipped to, to use this technology and to, to really support it. We really like to promote the technology that we have, and we really like to get it out there into our community. And, um, a, a lot of libraries that we know do tech petting zoos, um, and we love those programs. We think they're great. We think they definitely have a place in um, libraries, but we've come up with a couple of other ones to help promote the items that we have. The, one of the first ones that we did was a donuts and download program where we had just installed a download station here in our library. And so one Saturday morning, we stopped by and picked up a bunch of donuts. And we told everyone that um, wanted to come in and, and see our new download station. They could come in and get a donut and download some items. So um, that, was, that was successful. We had about 30 people, which for us was a good turnout to a program, and uh, they came in, they had a donut, and asked us questions about the download station. We've also started using digital story times. Uh, recently, we started doing some story times within our schools on some of their late start days, and it's been a great partnership for us with the, the schools, and uh, I work with some of the older elementary kids, and they really like to have an interactive title. They're so much into um, interactive content. So we try and make sure that we have at least one of those titles be digital. And um, Elizabeth will talk a little bit more, but she does most of the programming with our children. And um, she's, she's worked other ways to incorporate digital um, aspects into her story times. The last thing that we do um, that I want to talk about right now is our bookmarks um, book discussion group. We have 
a group that meets once a month. Um, it's really the, the non-committal book club. So patrons can either, you know, just join when they really like the title that we're talking about, or they can come to every single book discussion that we have. Whenever we're doing a book discussion, we make sure that we put the book title on um, at least one of our set of devices so that we have multiple copies available. It increases the number of copies that we can check out to patrons. Um, and for some of our patrons that are just interested in being part of the book club and not necessarily looking for a gadget, um, they might try a gadget out for the very first time. And it's been a great way to get people to to really try these out if they've been a little hesitant. Um, the, actually, the very, very last thing I wanted to talk about as far as promoting these, um, we just did our expansion, and that was a big project, and we were really excited about it. Um, one of the things that we really pushed for was this meat case, is what we like to call it. Some like to call it the jewelry case. I think meat case is just more fun. <laughs> um, it, it's meant to replicate the meat case that you would find in the grocery store with all the prime cuts of meat. This is our version with the meat being all of those wonderful gadgets that we have. We're able to display them before they were in a drawer behind our massive circulation desk. Our circulation desk in this renovation expansion project has been removed and we've replaced it with a much smaller service pod or a service desk and um, directly behind one of our service desks we have this meat case so um, patrons can walk up and look at all of the gadgets that we have available for checkout and it's a great way to promote the devices that we have. We have patrons that, that we've had in here for years and and despite all of our great efforts they never knew we had these devices until they actually saw them in this case. So it's been, um, I recommend meat cases for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so six is the magic number when it comes to e-readers. Um, Nooks and Kindles and Sonys can all have shared content. And so we have six devices, um, six Nooks, Nook devices, six Kindle devices, six Sony devices. That's what we, we aim for because we can buy the book, the title, and then we can have it on six different devices and that's really um, that's just really worked out. We've able, been able to just have those um, titles available especially uh, we'll talk a little bit about bestsellers later on and just having those more copies available is, is great. Um, Elizabeth is going to go into more detail about uh, more parts of our program. I was fortunate to be able to go over the good stuff, the positive aspects about our tech lending program, but since Elizabeth is much smarter, she gets to handle the bad and the ugly. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. The bad. Well, I, I don't want to discourage people from having this program because I think it's awesome. But just to give everyone a realistic overview, I need to touch on a few things that we've learned that are less than beautiful about this uh, type of lending. Um, oh, because technology can be scary. We have a little video to illustrate that. Oh, go back. That's okay. And here it is. <laughs> okay, that makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> okay, so certainly uh, the patrons can be afraid of technology, but we found, unfortunately, even our staff members were afraid of these readers when they first um, patrons first started coming in with their readers, and there were a few people on our staff who were terrified of these moments where the patrons would walk up with their reader, and we would be expected to help this person, and it could be any kind of reader. <laughs> You never know. So one of the things we did, first we made that decision to have our electronic circulating program be about finding different kinds of readers. I know some libraries will have, like Durango Library, which is also here in Southwest Colorado, they are awesome, and the, all of their readers are Nooks, and that's the decision they made because it's easier for them to manage, and I understand that. But for us, we wanted it to be a wonderful way for our patrons to explore some different technologies before they made their purchase. and. Um, Unfortunately, that was a little terrifying to some of our staff, just the thought of having to know different devices. And, and I think in the long run, it's been better. It's been beneficial. But what we did was we required every staff member to take home each device at least one night. 
So for um, some of them, they needed to keep them longer than one night in order to get a, get a grip on how to use it. But I really feel like that policy of us insisting everyone take each one home made a huge difference. So each, um, each staff member has experience with each type of device, and, and I think it's really given them a, a level of comfort, um, not just to help patrons with the devices that we circulate, but also to help patrons who come in with their own gadgets, their own devices, um, and um, we're able to help them better. Everyone who works here is able to help them better, not just Karen and I. Um, okay, so another thing that's not as pleasant as I would like that you probably will be dealing with if you use OverDrive um, is Adobe Digital Editions. Now, this piece of software is necessary for any device non-Kindle uh, in order to download eBooks. So Adobe just has has cornered this market, and this particular piece of software is extremely functional, but it's not the easiest thing to use. Some of the vendors, including 3M, have integrated this into their software to the point where it's very painless. Uh, Overdrive has not yet done that. So um, we found a couple of little tricks that we can use to make Adobe Digital Editions a little bit easier to manage on our end. Um, this first trick I got from Deb uh, in Durango, which is the town I just mentioned, which is close to us. Um, they uh, use Nook devices only, but on Nook and Sony devices, and it turns out Kindles as well, when the device comes back from the patron, you can plug it into your computer like a flash drive, open it up um, like a file folder to look at the files, and you can just delete the Adobe Digital Editions folder on the device, and that will wipe out your patron information and anything they checked out, the previous patron, and clear it out for the next patron. That's a great tip. Thank you, Deb. You're awesome for teaching us that. It saved us a lot of time before we would have to go in and oh, I don't even want to get into it, but it was complicated. So another trick that we've learned, Adobe Digital Editions a little bit um, persnickety when it comes to the order in which you do things. So it's a much easier if you plug in your device before you download your title. So that's just a little tip that we've been able to share with our patrons. It saves a lot of possible difficulty. Sometimes Adobe Digital Editions, for some reason, if you check out the item and then plug in your device, it thinks you're a different person. And it's annoying, but it can be avoided. Also, Adobe has these really crazy limits of how many, how many uh, readers you can have and how many computers you can attach to per Adobe Digital Editions account. So if you try to make an Adobe account for your library, which is how we started, what we started with, you can only do six devices and then you're going to bump up against your maximum limit. So we always encourage our patrons to use their own Adobe account with the devices. Sometimes it's just too intimidating we'll let them use ours, but it's, it's problematic. It's much easier if they use their own. Okay, um, another f thing we kind of learned uh, during the process of circulating these electronics, um, the first iPad that we bought, we just circulated it within the staff, luckily, <laughs> and we learned that some of these devices are harder than others, but many of them make it difficult to log out from things because they these devices really are designed to be individual. Um, the the manufacturers of the devices intend for them to be used by one person. They don't expect you to ever log out of anything. And um, we learned that if you sign into your email account on an iPad, it is extremely difficult to log back out. <laughs> so we advise patrons not to use these for their banking, certainly, but even just email or Facebook. You can use them for that, but please don't do it unless you understand how to get back out before you turn it in because this could become a privacy issue and it's just it, it's unrealistic to think that we will check every possible every possible I just found a typo I'm sorry I apologize for that um, every possible site you might have logged into and log you out it's not going to happen we have to put that onus on the patron to be responsible to log out of everything they get into another thing that has become an issue that we've had to learn about is um, to, uh, we, we use a device card, which I'll show you guys an example of in a minute, but you want to make sure that all the pieces come back with each. It's easy enough to forget the charger in the wall or 
you know, just mis mislay the cord or forget the card that goes in it. But we, we put a card in each, and it, it tells every patron what they need to put back in the container. And that's very useful because some of those AC adapters are proprietary and they're expensive. It isn't like you can just run over to Radio Shack and get another one for $10. So you, I also advise that you write your library's name on it in Sharpie or put a sticker and somehow identify those things because they're easy to lose, easy for patrons to lose, and sometimes difficult to replace. Sometimes the cords are in two pieces. That was confusing to some of our staff members because, you know, that has that power supply. So make sure that all the pieces of the cords come back. Here's an example of one of our device cards. Um, this particular reader, I think, has been retired, but there are similar readers in our collection still. And see, it just reminds the patron, put the reader in there. Remember the case, the cord, the adapter, the little piece of literature. We want these things back, and please don't put it in the drop box where it will get smashed and destroyed. And, the, and you can make yours, obviously, with your own logo and whatever you like to have, but they're very useful, and we have found them to be effective in getting all the parts back. Okay, so that was what's bad, but, but wait, there's more. <laughs> it gets worse. So some of the uglier things I will now share with you that we have learned uh, throughout this process. Um, first one. Things come back extremely gross and dirty, and I mean, it's gross. We wish we could wash all of our laptops in the sink like this cool keyboard that Karen found, but unfortunately, we have kind of more conventional electronics that don't uh, wash well. So we had to develop um, a method of dealing with that, and this is our beautiful laptop update box, and when the devices come back, um, the, the cards that you see in the front of the box there, those keep track of our updates. Um, we want to make sure that Java and Flash and Windows and everything gets updated on those laptops when they come back because, you know, of course we have safety software on there so that we can't have them automatically update. We have to manually do them. And these cards uh, prevent us from doing, uh, duplicating work. It just tells us, okay, Java's been updated recently. You don't need to mess with it. Um, or whatever, and each, each laptop has its own little card where we keep track of the updates. And you can see behind the cards, um, we have LCD screen cleaning wipes, which those work on the laptop screens and on the reader screens as well. Um, we use those, the Greenworks um, wipes, you can use any product that you're comfortable with, but we use those to kind of clean the laptops themselves and the keyboards, and um, the other container you see in there is the is the compressed air and we use that to get you know dog hairs and funk and oh my goodness I could tell you all the most disgusting things out of the inside of the, the keyboard what it um, the bags come back sometimes smelling like smoke or they have food on them and I haven't really found a really great way to clean the bags so right now we just kind of do soap and water you know touch spot clean those and um, it's not ideal but it works um, Okay, so another ugly aspect, obviously, is loss, and people ask me about that a lot. Um, but it's really, considering the 42 devices, I think we've had some pretty great um, results. The one e-reader that was damaged was a, a really responsible patron who broke it. She came and told us she paid for it. We replaced it. The three laptops, one was replaced by an irresponsible patron who has not taken care of it, and two died of just being old and done. And they died. Um, the, you know, we only use um, um, existing laptops that we've pulled out of our laptop lab for the circulating laptops. These are not brand new laptops that we're purchasing to circulate. So I expect some of this loss. You know, they're, they're already old before we circulate them. We have newer laptops in our in our laptop lab, and when we replace those, they trickle down into our circulating program. So keep, so please keep in mind that we have lost three since 2008, but they, they were pretty old. So you know that's to be expected. If you started with all new laptops, I imagine there would be less of that. So yeah, it's expensive. Um, this program can be expensive, but I know TechSoup sells remanufactured. Um, 
hardware, you can get laptops from them really reasonably. I've seen them two, three hundred dollars on there. So you could always start it with a pretty small amount. We spent nothing when we started. We had Sony give us some readers, and we had um, laptops that we already had that were going to be, um, what do we call it when we sell the computers? Surplus sale. We were going to surplus sell, sell them, and we decided instead to create this program where we circulate them. So for us, it was really kind of zero investment other than our time to kind of set this program up. And then as it was so successful, um, it was easy enough to get permission to purchase items because they were they circulate much better than books, really, dollar for dollar. They circulate, everything circulates so well that it's easily justified. Um, Okay. One thing that we learned circulating these is people get very attached to these electronics when they take them home. They love having them. And when we first started the laptop circulating program, we allowed people to renew. And we learned quickly that when someone has a laptop in their house for two weeks or more, they really feel a strong sense of ownership of that item and they are reluctant to return it and when they do return it they're so gross they're so much grosser if they keep them for long periods than if they return them after a week so we revised the policy so that now they need to return it after a week now if there are additional laptops available they can return one and take another right away but these laptops need frequent updates they need attention they need to be in the library these patrons need to understand that they're ours that we share with all the patrons and it's not just theirs to take home and keep forever. And so we did change that policy. So let's take a look at some of our rules that we've kind of developed throughout this process. We no longer renew things. So you need to bring it back and give it to us and if there's another one you can check it out. You're not going to renew it. We do have fines on these items. It's two dollars a day on the laptops and the GPS units. We, at this time, do not have fines on the readers, but that's something that we've explored possibly adding because we've had a couple of people take advantage and um, not return the readers in a timely fashion, which can be frustrating, especially if someone's waiting. Um, we have the patron sign a device form, and uh, I don't know whose idea it was, but I think it's brilliant. We have only one form. We'll give you a look at that and we put all of the electronics on it. And it basically says, I acknowledge that if I break this or lose it, I need to pay for it to be replaced. And so for each item um, we have here in this um, table, uh, it could cost up to this. So if someone is responsible and they come up to us, I, I never want to charge them more than whatever it costs us to replace it. Um, if they're going to be a jerk, you could use these figures to kind of be punitive if you if you were so inclined. Um, the only thing I've had someone replace at this point is the reader, and I just charged her what it cost me to get a new one because she was so terrific. The woman who has not paid for her laptop has a bigger fine on her card because I'm kind of furious with her for not taking care of it. So you could certainly do whatever works uh, for your library, but this for us is very very useful and, and helpful and it's been successful for us. Um, okay, so just to kind of recap, um, we feel like even though I've just spent 20 minutes telling you what's bad about this program, <laughs> I just wanted to give you an honest kind of overview. I do in general believe that these programs are a great idea and mostly because our patrons love this. Our patrons are thrilled to have this opportunity, especially in such a small town, to come and look at these different electronics before they purchase one. Um, it's, it's, you should know that we don't have a Best Buy or Circuit City or anything like that in this town. So if they want to see e-readers, the library is their only real option other than looking at them online. So it's really nice that we can offer this. And also being in a rural area, which I think many of you, probably all of you can relate to, many of our patrons don't have a computer at home and they can come and check out a laptop from us and that really makes the difference. Maybe their kids can do homework at home that they weren't able to do before. Um, and I noticed patrons really appreciating and using these devices and it's been wonderful. 
Uh, another thing is our bestsellers. We're a small library, so most of the time, if a book is new, we have one copy or two, maybe two. If it's hugely popular, we'll have two copies. And there get to be some serious holds. And it's nice we can put a bestseller on, say, the Sonys, and that's six items. So we'll, we'll have six more copies of a bestseller all of a sudden from buying one, which is usually $14.99 or so. So that's been a really wonderful way for us to kind of get bestsellers into our patrons' hands sooner. And once they get a device, maybe they were a patron who wouldn't have otherwise checked out a device, and it gives them the opportunity to try something that they wouldn't have otherwise tried. And I've found many patrons converted to loving devices because they wanted to read Fifty Shades and didn't want to wait a month, and so we gave it to them on a device, and now they want to buy their own. So it's been a really great um, experience for us. Would you like to add something here? Yeah, um, I, I want to add two things about that because um, one of my favorite stories is about a patron that came in and she was going on, a, a, she's an elderly woman and was going on a train trip and um, we kind of convinced her to try one of these devices out. She was so worried about taking it and even the night that we were checking it out to her and giving it to her, she was not really okay with this device. So she took some, some good old-fashioned paper books with her as well. And uh, when she came back from that trip, she was just so excited about how she was able to use it, how she enjoyed using it, and she never would have. And it was just wonderful to hear her say that she really appreciated the program that we had and that she was able to try this device out. Um, so it really allows us to move with our patrons and move at their speed, um, but it also really allows us to move forward. Since we have the devices, we understand them better. Um, we're more apt to be familiar with a variety of devices because we circulate a variety of devices, and we don't get just patrons that use Kindles. We get patrons that use Sonys, that use Kobos, that use a, a, a number of devices. And the more that we are exposed to as a staff and that our patrons are exposed to, I just feel the more um, technological education we have. So it really helps us to be more relevant and be, uh, be more cutting edge. It also just is it's opening some more avenues for our programming with our digital story times and, and having some more interactive um, programming. I wanted to find out from everyone that's participating today, if you can, in the chat box, um, can you tell us uh, by yes or no, do you offer some kind of technology program? And if yes, if you could list some of the devices that you have for checkout. Um, and you guys can all do that in the chat boxes. And then also, if we have any questions, we would love to take those. Uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of questions here, actually. <laughs> and Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just going to start at the top here. Oh, one person is, has just some um, concerns <laughs> um, about if someone who doesn't know anything about computers is running this kind of a program and a like, device comes back that is, as I said, a mess, that would um, be a problem. Um, I would guess that an answer to that would be, well, you really should be able to support the program or get someone on board who could. How would you deal with that? <laughs> That's great. Uh, this is Liz. Okay, well, first of all, you can always just reset your devices to zero, and it's a pretty simple process. Yeah. So if you're not going to load your devices with content, you can just get them back each time, wipe them out to zero, and then circulate it from there. If you do load them with content, you want to choose a device that easily reloads content, something that reloads um, using uh, Wi-Fi as opposed to being plugged in, which I believe all of the new devices, any device that you're going to buy that's retail device that's brand new right now, it's going to load that way. Some of the older devices that we have, some of the Sonys, the Kobo, they didn't always used to work that way. They used to, many of them, deliver only through USB. And many, and they, most, I think all of them still have that functionality as an option, but most of them deliver purchase content through Wi-Fi. So you could wipe it clean turn on the Wi-Fi, let it reload, and then recirculate it. Worst case scenario, if it comes back completely filled with who knows what. And I would say if you don't have somebody on staff that's available to do that, we actually um, presented this at our statewide conference back in October, and we had a library director that was 
uh, very leery about having a program herself because she wasn't comfortable with the technology. So we just spent an afternoon with her. So we're all librarians and we like to share this information. So um, both Liz and I are, are welcome for, um, to receive questions um, through our email and, and everything. We, we do like to, um, to help other libraries if they have questions. Great. Okay. Um, for handouts, did you create your own handouts or do you use materials supplied by the, each of the individual manufacturers of the devices? I pretty much hate any handouts that are provided to me. Um, I like to create my own. <laughs> so I'm kind of um, a little persnickety about that. So I created all of the handouts that I have. I use Publisher to create um, handouts. And um, again, those are things that I am willing to share with anyone that wants to, to see um, examples of handouts. Um, but going through, what I did is I just went through with each device, I went through the process. Um, I set up accounts on each device. I uh, downloaded books on each device. And that is the best way not only to learn, but also to, um, to be able to create a good handout that's really going to be helpful to your patrons. Great. Um, for the download station, what items were patrons downloading at that station? We had that, that download station um, originally was... Um, we started off having it for audiobooks, and we actually really continue um, kind of saving that computer for just downloading audiobooks. Um, we live, like many of you, live in rural areas, and um, some of, many of our patrons do not have any internet access, or they have dial-up still. Um, so they needed a place to be able to download content um, and, and that's what they, they mostly download. Um, there are a few videos that are available in our consortium, um, but we, we tell them if they have an e-reader, it's best to just do it on their own and with their own computer, um, or you know, if they have the Wi-Fi capability built into their device, which the newer devices do, then they can just come sit in the library and do it right then. Um, and they can even do that with audiobooks too on certain devices, but um, we really try and have that station. We paid a pretty hefty chunk of money to have that download station um, and we bought that through Overdrive and, and so we really gear that towards our audiobooks. Okay, um, and we have a couple, multiple questions from people about the items. Are they frequently stolen? Do people just not return them at all? <laughs> Rather than just saying, oh, I want to own it myself because I've had it for two weeks, but have things just completely gone missing? I thought I covered that but no, we've never had anything stole. That's stolen. That's the usual. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um. we, we have some good, honest patrons. <laughs> <laughs> um, that the Sony Library plan that you're part of, is that something that other libraries can still get in on? No, I think that was for 2009, mm. and it's over. But you can call Sony, and they have a, I can't listen to they have a, um, a line, a library-only helpline, which I can Google here, and I'll get it for you in just a second, and I'll type it into the thing. But I think anyone can use. Um, that's really nice. It's great. You get a person right away, and they help you with Sony devices, of course, because mm -hmm. they are Sony. Now, I can't, I don't recall if this was mentioned earlier or not. Are, is this something that both um, adults and children can borrow these, or is it just adults? You have to be an adult to check out a device. Uh, we, the device form that we fill out really would not be you know, legally binding if it was signed by um, a minor. We have told parents that if they are interested in letting their, we don't care if their children are using the device, but they are the responsible ones for that device. So they have to be, um, they have to have an adult library card to be able to, to check them out. And in the future, we would like to move some of our older devices and make them um, you know, uh, more available to like our teens, maybe doing like a 13 and up. We've tossed that idea around because um, there are some many patrons that um, are under 18 and, and they would really like to be able to check these items out. Um, so hopefully we can offer that in the future. Okay. Um, what kind of safety or security software, do you have anything like that that you put on the computers? Or is it mainly just the wipe them back to start when they get come back? 888, hold on. I don't know if you can remember, I'm going to have, I'm going to make Liz take this one. It's a hard question. <laughs> so we have two, 
the, the readers know. There's no software, but you can always wipe it back to original state. Um, that's kind of our backup plan. With the laptops, um, we have two, ver two softwares that we use, Clean Slate, which we get really inexpensively through our state library, and Smart Shield, um, which is another, basically it just keeps the hard drive how it is. Every time it restarts, it goes back to its original state. And um, those are the two that we use the most. Um, I think Clean Slate is a little bit um, easier to use and less expensive, so I'm leaning towards Clean Slate more and more. And um, I, that's, that's what we use. Um, I have a follow-up question to that one, being, being very familiar with that sort of software. And I, and I recommend it, but do you warn the patrons that, you know, if you save something to this hard drive and then you reboot it while you've got it checked out, it's gone? <laughs> Yes, we do. And we okay. actually checked them out with flash drives for a wow. while because we were so concerned about that particular issue. And um, the, the flash drives were mostly not used, so now we just tell, it's on the device card, I believe. It says, don't save anything to this computer. Um, we have so many repeat patrons at this point, I don't know, it's rare that we get a new patron using those laptops. I mean, now maybe since we've reopened and we have the meat case, that might be something that we need to reiterate to our staff to make sure we remind people. Uh, another option a lot of libraries do, and I think this is what, well, Durango doesn't circulate laptops, but you can just make, um, make a clone of it before you circulate it, and then you could just restore it to original state that way. Mm -hmm. That's another option. It's, I feel like it's more work, but it may not be, depending on how, you're, how comfortable your IT staff is with that. Oh, there's tons of them. All right. Thanks. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, I got a couple of different questions. Wanted to know. Uh, it seems to be a lot of work goes into maintaining and keeping up these computers when they come, the devices when they come back in. Um, both, I guess, the software and physically cleaning them. Um, <laughs> uh, how much time do you think that takes you about, like, per week? Is it a huge thing, or is it just kind of? Oh, this is going to scare some people off. <laughs> 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 um, you know. Uh, maybe 10 hours a week, um, and I share it with another staffer, and she's terrific. So I'm saying 10 hours between the both of us. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I guess we We've got a whole bunch of stuff coming in on this one, so you got to yeah. filter through it. Oh, yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually charge anything for doing the cleaning on them, depending on how dirty they come back? And I think they mean physically dirty. <laughs> charge a cleaning fee? You know, I haven't. But we should. <laughs> I, I like that idea, though, and it's interesting to pursue. We do have one particular patron who uses laptops a lot, and they come back smelling like smoke. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so strongly like smoke, I have to put it outside. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so, no, we haven't, but it's an interesting idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now, if the library has an Amazon account, can that content from that account that is purchased or downloaded be loaded onto something that is non-Kindle? Okay, so Kindle has an app. So if you're going to circulate tablets with Kindle apps, yes, that would count as one of your seats for your items, and you can have six. So, um, and it's not always exactly the same. I know that if you buy things from J.K. Rowling, she lets you have eight. And they don't have to all be the same kind of device. So, but, but as far as Kindle, Sony, and Nook, six. Six is the number. And a device with an app acting as a, a Nook or a Kindle counts as one. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you're, but to, to, to add, you're not going to put a Kindle book on a Sony reader. That's just not going to happen. Right, right. Same with um, a, a Nook-specific um, book. Any, um, we do have our devices preloaded where we go to the Sony store and we purchase those titles from the Sony store and those only work on the Sony um, readers. Um, same with Nook. We go to the Nook store and purchase them. Um, and, and that actually brings up another interesting point is we had to, since we um, use these devices, we have to make sure that we place our order and then we immediately remove our credit card from the account so that <laughs> patrons can't go back through and accidentally order something on their own. And that has happened, unfortunately. <laughs> but it was just once. <laughs> we, we've got reports here from, from libraries where devices come back and somebody's purchased 
content, and we basically had to say, somehow you left your the library's credit card attached, or else that wouldn't have been possible. Oh, the, yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so disconnect the credit card. Do not leave the credit card attached to the account. We had to um, kind of go in, in, a, in a, a different way with Kindle where we had to, um, we actually purchase a, a gift card to Amazon so that we can buy content. And then we make sure that we use all of that gift card. I think there's, we leave you know, a few cents on there so somebody cannot add to that device because it wants you to um, always have some kind of payment option connected to it. That's a, that's, that's a great idea, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we've got a couple of people asking you to explain more about that digital story time. Okay. So um, right now what we've been doing, you have to know that we've been closed for two months because we were remodeling. Mm -hmm. So the only programming that we were doing in the last 8 to 12 weeks, whatever, has been outreach. So we take a, an iPad out to... Um, well, Karen's been doing it really with the big kids. Uh, I am working on getting some digital uh, story times going with our new smart board, which is in my early literacy room, and that's going to be a little different. But I think what you're asking about is the iPad, so I'm going to give it to Karen. I have. I always try to find at least one app that kind of fits into our theme, um, and and I usually find a free app. And actually, Liz found one for me that was the Talking Yeti when we were doing. Um, we were doing monsters or so, um, so it was fantastic. The kids loved it. They each had a turn saying something, and then the talking Yeti would say it back, and they all found that just absolutely enjoyable. They loved it. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> okay, um, a, question, a technical question about MP3s, checking out those. What can the patron actually do with that other than downloading an audio book onto it? What would they, are they generally using an MP3 player for? That's a great question. And we actually had our MP3 players didn't move as well as I had hoped when we first got them. And I think that's part of the reason because we had blank, empty MP3 players. And people could download audiobooks here. And it did happen. I found myself downloading it more frequently than the patron and so what we decided to do during this closure is we bought some audiobooks that we own and we can put those on up to six devices no three audiobooks only let you have three so we would put we put some actual books on there now and I know that they're gonna circulate a lot better um, I'm still working on getting the Harry Potter audiobooks which we really want to put on but um, my credit card won't do it it thinks it's fraudulent because it's a UK purchase so um, I still have some some calling to do on that credit card to make that work, but we're putting some audiobooks. We have put some, and we're putting some more on, and I think they'll circulate better when there's something on there for people to try. Um, have you had any issues or thought about hand, uh, what to do about with ADA accessibility? I don't understand. Um, I'm 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 not understanding the. The ADA, question. Americans with Disabilities Act for people that need yeah, special. I that is. Right. Yeah, I understand what that is. But what was the the question well, as far as? Well, how do you handle those issues, or have you had any? Um, because uh, ADA accessibility on the left on the things you're checking out. Um. Um. We we have a volunteer <laughs> who's in a wheelchair, and she's able to use all of these devices. So I guess I don't really understand what element of ADA these things wouldn't be accessible to. You're saying an MP3 player is no good for a deaf person, so they check out a reader. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> right? Oh uh, okay, the, uh, the clarification is that they've been told Thank that um, Nooks are not ADA accessible because there's no audio component on the older ones. Um, I would... I would offer our MP3 players for somebody yeah. that yeah. is... Yeah. It, it, um, that would need to hear it in, in an audio form um, and and then vice versa that um, someone who is deaf to offer them an e-reader. Um, so I know, um, you know, people that are looking for audiobooks, yes, you can do audiobooks on some of the newer readers. Mm -hmm. um, our readers do not have audio um, capability. They're, they're old. They're already old. So... <laughs> But our, you know, our Kindle Fire and our Color Nook, yeah, we could, um, you can have some some audio books. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so you offer the various types of devices so that there is not a problem. There's always, there is something that someone can use. That's how I feel, is that we do try and offer something for everyone. And I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe somebody's referring to a recent article that was on Library Link of the Day that um, talked about that. But um, I really do feel that, you know, since we're not limiting ourselves to just one device, just one type of device, that we really are providing something for everyone. Exactly, perfect. So um, that we are out of the time for this session. Um, if you, there are lots of other uh, other questions that came in, if we didn't get to answer, ask your question, um, you can contact them. Um, their email addresses are there. You can feel free to contact them directly to ask your questions. All right. <laughs> thank uh, you so wanna, much. Yes, I want to thank the pair of you for for doing this. It was absolutely wonderful, and and uh, sounds like people were really getting into it and asking a lot of questions. Uh, so with that, uh, Krista, did you hear? Okay. Uh, with that, we are now at the end of this session, and we're going to take a 10-minute break, and we will be back uh, with you at the top of the hour at 3 o'clock Central Time uh, to talk uh, some more about programming. Um, thanks a lot for attending. We'll be back in a few minutes.